Okay, for today's Ento Live, we'll be delving underwater into rock pools and hearing all about the amazing camouflage abilities of the chameleon prawn. And uh, I'm really interested to hear what techniques you need in such a changeable environment. So, uh, Sam, over to you. Uh, looking forward to the talk. Great. Thanks, Kieran. Um, yeah, I'm Sam, previously of the University of Exeter, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you guys about my uh, PhD research. Um, so I'm going to start the talk with a bit of an introduction into camouflage and how it works. Uh, then I'll talk to you guys a little bit about the intertidal zone and why it's such a cool place. Uh, and then I'll move on to my kind of PhD research, uh, looking at how chameleon prawns maintain their camouflage uh, in this environment. Uh, and then we'll finish with a bit of a whistle stop tour, looking at how um, our impact on the natural world uh, might be more broadly affecting animals' camouflage strategies. So um, what is camouflage? Camouflage is a strategy by which animals attempt to remain unseen in their environment. Um, and it's important to think about it, how it acts. And it acts against the visual system of visually hunting predators or equally of prey species. There's lots of predators rely on camouflage as well. Um, and there's a great variety of strategies by which animals um, maximize concealment in the natural world. Uh, the most kind of basic and kind of common idea is a strategy called background matching, um, which is really simple but for, and forms the foundation of most other strategies. And that is uh, animals tend to resemble, resemble the colors and patterning of the environments in which they're found. Um, for example, this clingfish in amongst the seaweed and the rock pools down here in uh, Cornwall. Um, another strategy that's really commonly used by animals in the natural world is something called disruptive coloration. And this is an idea where high contrast markings um, can help disguise your body's, uh, body's outline or body surfaces um, to avoid being spotted in relation to background variation. And then this is a really um, effective strategy, as you can see with this scorpion fish. Uh, in the grey bucket, it's really easy to see the fish and its whole body outline, but if you put that fish into its natural habitat where there's lots of other colours and textures, it's much harder to spot that body shape. Uh, and then a final idea is something um, called mimicry, which works in a slightly different way. So those the two strategies I talked about previously, uh, the idea of them is that you don't get spotted by a potential predator. Uh, with mimicry, you mimic something uninteresting in the environment. Um, for example, a leaf uh, like this uh, Madagascan leaf insect. And with this strategy, the idea is that a predator can spot you, but it doesn't matter because it's not uh, interested in what you are. So, um, Camouflage to be effective, there needs to be some kind of relationship between an animal's color patterns and colors within its visual environment. Um, and this is something we call a phenotype environment association. Um, and the example here is sand fleas on Ascension Island. All of these are the same species and their patterns vary by the beaches that they're found on, which are of different sandy substrates. And what research from some people in the Sensory Ecology Lab showed is that these different color types are best camouflaged against their various beaches. So this is that association we see. Um, the intertidal zone is, the, is where I've been lucky enough to do most of my field work. Uh, living down in Falmouth, we've got the beaches all around us and these rock, the rocky shores are a really dynamic, diverse place, um, both for seaweeds and a wide range of animal uh, species. Yeah, I've been really fortunate to spend a lot of time in waders splashing around and you get these really nice interactions with the uh, wildlife, with, like with this dogfish here. And the diversity of the animals that uh, live in the rock pools is really incredible, particularly of the invertebrates. Um, and there's a few, just a couple of slides here showing some images captured just off the coast in Falmouth. And one of the things to think about is there's this huge variety in coloration as well. And not all of this would be for camouflage. Some of these color patterns might be warning signals. Uh, letting other potential predators know that they're unpalatable animals to eat, or it could be a kind of mating signal to improve your mating success. Um, but yeah, the rock pools, uh, I'm sure many of you have been rock pooling, but you can some fi find some really interesting animals in them. And um, one thing to think about when it comes to the intertidal zone is for aquatic animals, it's a really changeable place in which you live. So every day there's going to be big changes to the with the tides and how much submerged habitat there is. Um, so this is taken from the same spot on Gillingway's Beach, and you can see at um, low tide, the animals that live in this habitat are 
um, restricted to isolated rocky pools, whereas when the tide's in, there's not much more movement. Um, and one thing this can mean is that the predator communities that these animals experience will change as well. So you've got things like the rock goby in the top left, uh, that lives in the rock pools all day, every day. Um, but at high tide, you get things like uh, pollux, more pelagic fish, moving and forage in the area over the reef. And then equally at low tide, you may get pressure from more terrestrial uh, species like gulls. So the animals that live in this area are going to have to deal with a whole range of predators. So camouflage is really important to be as good as you can make it. And we know some things about camouflage in this um, habitat. Lots of work has been done by the Sensory Ecology Lab uh, down here in Cornwall. And one of the things that animals can do is they can rely on different camouflage strategies depending on what part of the intertidal zone they live. Uh, so here, this is the green shore crab. And the top image shows juveniles that live in rock pool habitats, which are much more variable in terms of their color and pattern. And the bottom images show the mud flats, which is much more uniform. And so you can see with the juvenile crabs, the ones that live in the variable habitat tend to look like they're relying on disruptive coloration a bit more, whereas the crabs that live in the uniform muddy habitat, they're much more uniform and rely on just maybe background matching. And these, these uh, camouflage strategies might change as the animals age. Uh, so here we've got staying with the shore crabs. They, when they're juveniles, as we just discussed, they're really variable. But as they age, they all move towards this kind of uniform mottled greeny brown coloration. Um, and this, we, what we think happens, allows a more generalist camouflage strategy. So these adult crabs are then able to roam the interstellar zone a bit more freely uh, if they're looking for mating uh, opportunities or food or shelter. Um, so this kind of generalist camouflage is something like the idea would be that you have some mediocre benefit of camouflage across a wider range of habitats. Whereas what we've talked about earlier in the talk is that the camouflage to be most effective, you need the, you need a really close relationship with your visual environment. And so this kind of comes on to the main question of my PhD research, uh, which is that natural habitats are really variable. So if your, if your camouflage is effective, to be effective needs to match a specific area, how do animals cope with all this variation in the natural environment? What happens if they need to leave their match patch? Um, and so my collaborator in this effort is a species called the chameleon prawn. Uh, which is really common in the UK if you um, can manage to find them. And um, what's really interesting about them is they're really variable in colour. So this is all one species. And so they're found in various forms of block colour to varying degrees of uh, transparency. But they all live in the same kind of habitat. So it's, it kind of generates a question of why, is, why are they all not one particular camouflage type? What are the benefits of all these um, various colour patterns? So um, one thing to talk about quickly is just some of our methods about how we assess camouflage. And so what you should think about is that camouflage has evolved to defeat certain types of predator vision. And animal color vision varies massively depending on, on what species you are. So based on the structure and components of your eye. So we as humans are trichromatic, seeing in the kind of red, green, blue, uh, versus my dog is dichromatic. So it only has two color channels. So we will see colors in a very different way. So what we try and do here in the Visual Ecology Central Ecology Lab is to model how predators, ecologically relevant predators, are viewing these color patterns so we can get a real um, ecologically relevant view of if camouflage is actually effective against a real predator rather than uh, me, a human. Um, so from all my research, I, I use the pollock, which is dichromatic, and the goby, which is trichromatic. But the data I'll show you today uh, focuses just on, on the goby because the two are very are very comparable and bold in terms of uh, camouflage. First bit of work, kind of uh, trying to investigate this variation in coloration. And we also know from some earlier work on species that they're able to change color. So one reason animals might vary in color patterning and um, appearance is that they may be camouflaged to different areas of the habitat. And so what this would mean is that you're not directly competing with other members of your own species necessarily, and it might let you live in a broader range of habitat types in your, in your area. And this is something called uh, uh, colour polymorphism, which I know some of you guys heard about uh, if you went to the last moth talk. And so the chameleon prawns are slightly different here because polymorphism implies there's kind of genet some kind of gen genetic determination, uh, whereas the chameleon prawns, as we'll learn, are very changeable. 
And so they, they're something, a phenomenon called uh, polyphenism, which is color varies with the environment. Um, but polymorphism or polyphenism aside, it's still a fixed strategy potentially. So if, even if your species is highly variable, if individual color types um, are fixed, they're still isolated to particular areas of the habitat. And so one um, get around to this that lots of animals use is a strategy called color change, um, which I'm sure you can figure out what that means. And that's the, simply the changing appearance over time in relation to environment. And um, this is adopted by a wide range of species. Um, the kind of top dog, so to speak, are the cephalopods. So you're kind of the octopus and the cuttlefish. This is a European cuttlefish. And they're able over a couple of seconds to make these incredible changes to their color patterning and even body textures. Um, made even more interesting as we're not really sure how they, how and if they see color. Um, but lots of fish change color over a period of minutes. Uh, and lots of other species like this is peppered moth larvae, uh, caterpillars, they change color over a period of weeks. And so these slower changes in um, color are more common in nature, but slightly more confusing because with the cuttlefish example, it's easy to see how if a cuttlefish swims through its environment and can change color over a matter of seconds, it could constantly adapt its appearance in relation to background variation. Uh, but for things changing color slowly, what happens in the middle? Um, you start off camouflaged and you begin to change and then weeks later you're camouflaged again. So in the middle there, how are you, how are you not getting eaten? So these slower changes are much more interesting in some ways. Yeah, the first bit of my uh, work, we're focusing on green and red block color types. And what we want, they're associated with two seaweeds, so green sea lettuce and red dulse. Um, and so we wanted to find out if the red and green prawns are well camouflaged to fish vision against these seaweeds. Uh, and then we also wanted to investigate what happens when we got them to change color. So when we kept them on uh, seaweeds of opposite color, so the green prawns were kept on the green seaweeds and the red prawns were kept on uh, green seaweeds, or the green prawns and red seaweed. Uh, and so what do we find? Uh, this graph is just showing us the basically the level of camouflage. And so we've got a color similarity index on the y-axis. And what this is is a metric called just noticeable differences. Um, and put simply, it's just it's just a scale of, of how similar two colors are. So values below one are considered to be identical. And then as values increase, camouflage gets worse. And so what this graph is showing us is that the green prawns are really well camouflaged against the green sea lettuce, and the red prawns are really well camouflaged against the red seaweed. And that on the opposite seaweeds, they're not very well camouflaged at all. So we took them to the lab and we kept them for a month on those opposite colors, and we use digital photography to track these color changes. Uh, and so what these graphs are showing you are changes in hue, and hue is a metric where it's just relative, a ratio of relative proportions of different wavelengths of light. Um, and so what we can see here is that the greens and the reds start in very different areas of the graph, and they cross over as the green prawns turn red and the red prawns turn green. Um, and then the graph on the uh, on, with the color similarity index is what we've just discussed, where lower values are better camouflage. So these two graphs are showing us, to, telling us together that these prawns are changing color against these mismatching seaweeds, and that this changing color translates to an improvement of camouflage from their predator's visual pers perspective, which is great for the prawns. And this this photo is just a couple of examples of of these uh, the species changing color. So in the summary of this kind of section. The, these red and green color types are giving a specialist camouflage benefit against certain seaweeds in the environment. Um, and they're able to change color to improve this if they're, if they're mismatching. But as we've discussed, these changes are quite slow. So what we think is happening is the, the seaweed, the, the, sorry, the rock pools undergo seasonal changes in the seaweeds that live in them. So you get more green sea lettuce in the summer, for example, and that dies off in harsher periods of weather. So what we're thinking is that the slower color change here might be helping the species track slower natural variation in the environment. Um, but as the changes are slow, uh, what happens day to day if a, if a prawn, for example, is knocked off its perch by a, by a wave during the tidal change, or if it needed to move around to find a mate or a new, feet, or a new food. Uh, and that moves on to the next area of my research, which is looking at how behaviors can improve camouflage. And this is a really simple idea, um, but has received less attention than uh, research looking at color traits. Um, 
So the basic kind of the idea would be that animals tend to choose an area to rest where their camouflage is, is uh, best match. And there's lots of examples of species doing this in the wild, but one that I really like are these moths. Um, you should be able to spot them in the middle of those images if you look closely. And what these moths do is that they not only choose to rest on a bit of tree bark that matches their general color patterns, but once they land, they readjust their position so that their patterning tends to line up more effectively with structures in the bark itself, which is quite cool. Um, these behavioral preferences of, of the animals uh, might be really important for main, uh, maintaining the color matching we see in the natural world. Uh, and this can be also demonstrated in really artificial environments. So this is a um, area of development in Spain and these grasshoppers are found in light and dark morphs. And if you survey these bits of concrete, you tend to find the lighter individuals on the light bits of concrete and the darker individuals on the dark bit. So the behaviors are likely driving this kind of separation, excuse me. And then another important idea is uh, to think about is that color change and behavior don't necessarily work independently. These two strategies will occur evolve together and may support um, each other within a species to get more effective, uh, a more effective match. So we know that the rock pool gobies can change color over a couple of minutes, but we also know that they're very good at choosing an area where to rest where their color is already well camouflaged. So, uh, green and red prawns again. Um, what I was interested in here was testing if these prawns ch actively chose seaweeds that matched their coloration for better camouflage, and also how this works with color change. So we know the prawns can change color. Um, what happens to behavior? Does behavior switch in line with, with an animal's appearance? And this is really important, uh, so you can have a green prawn on a green seaweed, uh, which for whatever reason could turn to a red prawn, if that red prawn doesn't have the behavioral adaptations to source out a red area to rest, it could quite easily become a dead prawn. Um, and so this is an area that's not been very, uh, very um, well explored before. And so we, I put uh, green and red prawns into these wide choice chambers where they chose between green sea lettuce and red dulse. And I just recorded their behavioral preference. What seaweed did they choose to rest on? And what this graph is showing you the proportion of choice and it just shows really clearly that green prawns really like choosing green seaweeds, red prawns choose red seaweeds. And so that kind of supports our idea that these uh, color types are well matched to their associated seaweeds, which they're, they're specializing. And then we took these uh, prawns back to the lab and ran another color change experiment where they were kept on mismatching seaweeds, but this time running behavioral trials at the beginning, middle and end of the experiment to try and see what happens with behavior. And so the, the change uh, data is very sim similar to what I've already showed you, which is encouraging for me, but also nice and interesting showing that the uh, prawns change color. We get red prawns turning green and green prawns turning red, and the, overall these changes improve camouflage. Uh, but this time what we've also managed to show is that the behavioral preference, seaweed preferences change in line with an animal's color patterns. So as a green prawn turns red, it's more likely to choose red seaweed. And the same is true for red prawns turning green, which is great. And we're hoping to publish that in the next um, couple of months when I uh, get on with it. Uh, so yeah, summarizing that section, we know that these prawns are actively maintaining their camouflage day to day through these behaviors, and that these behaviors work very closely with other color traits like color change. So working together, these two maximize camouflage, we think. And then I'm just gonna talk a bit, a final bit about my, um, PhD research before moving on to the applied stuff. And this is looking at transparency, because I told you guys about the fact that some of these uh, color types are varying degrees of transparency. And the idea behind it is that, you know, transparency would be the perfect camouflage strategy. Um, your body becomes a window to your background. However, uh, being transparent is actually quite challenging. Um, and one of the reasons it's not always the best camouflage strategy, particularly, is to do with how light behaves when it crosses body surfaces. So if you have light moving through air and then it uh, hits a transparent organism, there will be a degree of scattering of light and reflectance that particularly for species that can see polarized light, that's really, really apparent. So it's not always a, gonna be an effective camouflage strategy. Um, and this, this challenge is reduced in aquatic habitats 
So the difference between uh, the insides of an animal's body and, the, and water is less apparent than, say, air. So transparency tends to be associated with aquatic environments, particularly pelagic um, communities. And that, if you think about it, if you're out in the open ocean or in the middle of a large body of fresh water, there's nowhere to hide if you're at the water's surface. There's not, or generally, and you know, there's rarely, you know, mats of floating sargassum, but for the most part, you're on your own. Uh, and so that's why we tend to see transparency in these communities. But there are examples in terrestrial ecosystems. So in this picture here, uh, taken from a review, you can see that there's a bus flow of transparent wing panels, but you also get this really cool uh, partially transparent glass frog, um, which is obviously terrestrial. Uh, and one of the idea interesting things about the, um, transparency is that it might form a more generalist camouflage strategy. And so this is some research done by my colleague Rafa, um, who lives in Brazil. And these aren't chameleon prawns, although they look very much like them. Um, these are carnival prawns, as you would expect from, from uh, our Brazilian uh, colleagues. And they, their camouflage strategies are very comparable. Uh, but what Rafa's managed to show is that the transparent individuals have a more streamlined body shape and are much more active. And so are much better at exploring the environment. And this generalist camouflage might support that. And so what he's also found is that lots of these smaller transparent individuals are the males. So what they're doing is moving around the seaweeds, looking for mating opportunities potentially while the bigger block color females wait on their um, matched patch. And uh, transparency can have some interesting interactions with uh, adaptations like color change as well, particularly in deeper water. So lots of predators look up and look for silhouettes in the, in the, in the, in the water column above them. And so transparency is really effective against downwelling light. Uh, whereas if you were heavily pigmented, you would cast a shadow and you'd be easier to spot. But in the deeper waters, there's species like dragonfish, which can have uh, these bioluminescent searchlights associated with their eyes. And these are great against transparent animals because of what we talked about a minute ago, about how light behaves when it interacts with the edges. And so these bioluminescent searchlights really strongly show up transparent individuals, but particularly if you're deep red, because there's not much red light at the depths of the ocean, it's a very, it being block color red is a much more effective strategy there. And so these researchers have shown with the uh, pelagic squid that they can switch a camouflage strategy based on kind of predator cues, which is really interesting. Back to the prawns. Um, one thing to note is that these the transparent prawns are hugely variable in themselves, and because this was some kind of a baseline work, we've lumped lots of them in together. Um, but it's important to recognize that there's so much variation within this transparent group themselves. And this is something we're looking to work on in the future. And so what I'm interested in this section was kind of going over what we've done with the, of the block color morphs, where I'm interested in are they showing behavioral preferences? And then I'm interested in how they may change color in relation to their, their background seaweeds. So just to remind you, what we talked about earlier on the left is the graph showing that green prawns really like green seaweeds and red prawns choose the red seaweeds. And then on the right, we have the same kind of experiment run with transparent prawns. And what we found this time is that there was no significant preference. Um, and also most, lots of the transparent prawns, if they have patterns and patches of color in them, that tend to be red. So if anything, we might expect it to be um, skewed more towards the red seaweeds, but we didn't, we didn't observe that at all. So they're not choosy between where they're necessarily resting. Uh, for the color change experiment, we decided to mix it up a little bit to try and understand what might, why you might be transparent and why you might not be. Um, so we had three treatments where the transparent prawns were kept either in uniform green with just sea lettuce, uniform red with just the dulse, or a mixture of the two. And the idea here was that maybe the ones in the single color backgrounds will, it's at that point, it's better to just be on the block color whereas the individuals that are in a mixed habitat still, maybe they maintain transparency. So uh, this is the uh, data we've found from that color change experiment, which we're trying to publish as well. And the seaweed treatment these prawns went into had a really strong effect on, on their kind of color change tra trajectory. Um, so you can see here on the top left, you can see all the three treatments together. And this is, uh, on that graph, you can see the dotted lines, the dotted green line is the general color of sea lettuce, and the dotted red line is the general color of, of dulse. And they all start kind of up there, as I just mentioned, because lots of the where there are colors, those colors tend to be red. 
And so we should see the strongest response in the prawns that kept on just the green seaweeds. So we should see this really strong shift where lots of the transparent prawns are becoming block green. Uh, the mixed substrate um, treatment, which is the bottom left graph, is much more confusing but interesting. And so in this um, treatment, we found some of the prawns would go block green and some of them would go block red, and but some of them would also maintain, maintain transparency. And this is where it's quite interesting in relation to that um, variation I mentioned at the start with these guys. There's lots of different types of transparent. And so what we think is going on is particular uh, transparency strategies are more effective at certain times. Um, for the final panel, the red uh, the prawns are just kept on the red seaweed. It's hard to see what's going on here because they already start off a bit red. Uh, but what this looked like in real life was that lots of these did become uh, block red as we expected. So just to summarize that section quickly, um, we think what's happening here is that the transparent prawns are enjoying some kind of generalist camouflage benefit, similar to carnival prawns in Brazil. Maybe they're able to explore the environment more freely. Maybe we could find that lots of these trans smaller transparent individuals are also uh, males, like Rafa did in, in his populations. And another interesting dynamic to do with the transparency in this species is to do with how they change as they age. So. When young are released, uh, they live a pelagic lifestyle for a number of months. So they go out to sea, float around as larvae, and through that entire period, they are tr completely transparent. They then, uh, at some point, at the whim of the currents, return back to the rocky shore. And at that point, they settle in an area, they're transparent, they have some form of generalist benefit, and then they will adapt to the colors in that area. So if you're in an area with lots of green seaweed, you may see prawns start to shift towards that coloration. And another idea with these guys is to look at the disruptive coloration I mentioned right at the start. So particularly if you look at this prawn on the uh, right, these bigger transparent prawns with patches of color, if you look at them from the side, there's big panels of transparency and block color. And we think they might be acting as some kind of, uh, some disruptive benefit uh, hiding the body's outline. Particularly if you think about it, often with the smaller fish like the gobies, they're gonna be looking at them side on potentially. Yeah, just to kind of summarize uh, the PhD work I'm uh, discussing with you guys today, uh, I've kind of demonstrated that the prawns rely on combinations of both behavior and color change to maintain camouflage, and that these adaptations work together to maximize concealment in a really changeable world. And these also result in generalist and specialist camouflage strategies. So you have specialists that sit on particular seaweeds, and you might have generalists that move more freely around the environment. Uh, but there's a lot of work still to be done on this species. And some of that is uh, work that I'm indirectly involved with. There's newer work on this species looking at how uh, our impact might be affecting their camouflage. And I'm sure I don't need to tell many of you that we're having quite an impact on the natural world. Uh, this infographic here is just showing the kind of six biggest threats to biodiversity. Um, and what's important to consider is these uh, challenges might be quite subtle. So with, if you take pollution, for example, you could have a really big pollution event which could lead to mass die-offs. Uh, but on the other side of that, you could have a very slow introduction of pollution into the environment at a non-lethal level for a prolonged period of time. So you might not see these big mass die-offs, but they might be having chronic effects on our wildlife. And this is an area that's starting to be explored. And, and another thing is um, the importance of sensory ecology for conservation. And so sensory ecology is how animals um, experience and interact with the world. Uh, and it's important to recognize that, that just as color vision is very variable between species, how what, how what sensory cues they interact with as well. So we are very visual, but other species, particularly uh, marine invertebrates, can be, uh, their cues more importantly can be chemical. And that's what we think is happening with the prawns. Um, some ba basic background work that was done on them kind of indicated that color doesn't seem to be very important for their behavioral preferences. So we think they might be following cues to particular seaweeds. So if these are being uh, disrupted by us, it's important to kind of understand what effect this might have. And so one example uh, that's come out of the Central Ecology Lab is some work by Emily Carter, uh, Carter, a master's student. And she looked at how shipping noise might in, interact with color change in, in uh, shore crabs. And what she showed is that the, the crabs that experienced shipping noise were actually much worse at changing color. And so their camouflage capabilities were reduced 
possibly due to stress from these, these um, loud shipping noises. And we, we're here in Falmouth, we buy a big dock. So this is, you know, going to be having a wide impact on a lot of species in the area. Another um, broad challenge that we're interested in is what I kind of touched on earlier is the kind of how, how are chemicals affecting animals and, and behaviours and animals behaviours can be very sensitive and can be a really good indicator for us and there's a problem in the environment. We don't need to wait for everything to die before we start to spot that things are going wrong. And um, so one chemical we've worked with is something called oxybenzone which is a um, organic UV filter, ultraviolet light. And so it's, it's common in a wide range of sunscreens as well as a photo stabilizer in various plastics and numerous other um, uses. And it enters the environment in various ways, but it has already been shown to have quite uh, devastating impacts on certain communities, um, particularly on corals causing things like bleaching, but also going up the food chain. So it's from being accumulated in fish, fish tissues because they're eating lower trophic animals that have absorbed this chemical. Um, yeah, and that, well, you know, for example, with the corals, uh, if you slap a load of sun cream on and then go swimming over a coral reef, most of those chemicals are going to wash off your skin and interact with the environment. So raising awareness to these issues is really important, considering there are simple steps like using a, a sun cream without oxybenzone. Uh, and so we did some more behavioral experiments. Well, I say we, fortunately, I didn't have to do these ones. Uh, Christy Judd and Anna Witter, two master's students that worked in the sensory ecology lab, uh, and they ran the same experiments you've kind of already seen from earlier with the red and green prawns choosing between red and green seaweeds, but this time they introduced oxybenzone as a, as a pollutant. Um, and so just to talk through this graph quickly, for green, green prawns are on the left, red prawns are on the right. Uh, on the left hand panel, those are prawns in a control treatment, so there's no pollution, and then you have a low and a high uh, pollution treatment going from left to right. And so what this is showing us is that initially, and with the control treatments, we're seeing these behaviors that we're already expecting. Green prawns choose green, red prawns choose red, which is great. But then you can see as you go across the figures right, uh, even at, at low and high concentrations of oxybenzone, these behaviors are being quite drastically um, impacted. And there's, there's an increase to the proportion of incorrect choices. So green prawns will choose red seaweeds. And there's also an increase to no choices um, going on, the prawns just sit there, which would make you vulnerable to predation in a different way. And sorry, what I should have explained is also on the x-axis, you've got trials one, two, and three. And what one is, is immediately after exposure. Uh, what two, two is after 20 minutes when they've been returned to clean water. And three is an hour after that. So not only are these concentrations of chemicals having a big impact, these impacts are persisting for quite a long time after the exposure period. And so this works in review at the moment and will hopefully be published soon. Uh, another challenge that our environments face in a changing world is the introduction of invasive species. And this could happen through a more natural pro process where species are shifting their range to cope with uh, changes to their environment like global warming. So you get this shift north, um, but also it can be introduced by us, you know, in shipping ballast or various times as documented, documented evidence of us just putting things out for the sake of it. Um, and so while I've been down here in Falmouth, uh, it's been quite stark actually. So on the left here, we've got a uh, type of sargassum and in the middle, we have something called hookweed. And these uh, originate from the West Pacific and have made its way over to our shores. But the hookweed I know has been around for over, well over hundred years now. In recent years here in the lab, what we've observed is that these seaweeds pretty much take over in some areas in the summer. Um, and so Rafa, the colleague I mentioned earlier, who works in Brazil, came over for a year to try and investigate these uh, questions about how are animals like the chameleon prawns coping with this variation, invasive variation in the environment. Um, his work is just he's just recently gone back to Brazil and he's working on analyzing all of this at the moment. Um, but just some kind of interesting snippets from his work. Um, in the checkered boxes here, we're looking at behavioral choices similar to what you've already seen, but this time between matching and mismatching seaweeds of native and invasive origin. Uh, and so the data is a bit more messy here, but generally what, what's interesting is that both the color types are interacting with these invasive species quite a lot. And then he's also run uh, color change experiments looking at this, 
uh, and shown that these prawns are really able to change color to match these match these invasive uh, environments. So the story may be not that stark for the chameleon prawns, they're kind of their plasticity and behavior and color maybe lets them, um, in some ways there are opportunities to be had from these invasives. So for example, the uh, wireweed, the, the sargassum is much more structurally complex and creates these huge columns in the, in the summer and is around much more of the year when our, our native seaweeds die back. So this big structural column provides a lot of shelter and so Rafa found color morphs of, of many kinds living within a single seaweed. So this is, is quite a new area of research. Um, so yeah, a bit of a whistle uh, stop tour of that, uh, highlighting some of my colleagues' work. Um, and just to summarize that is that pollution can cause non-lethal changes to animals. So, and that can affect species behaviors. And so a, a, a pollutant that negatively infect, uh, affects a behavior in a camouflaged animal uh, might lead to an increase in the likelihood of being eaten. So there's an indirect um, lethal effect of the pollutant. Um, and then, yeah, as we've just discussed, uh, these interesting changes to biological communities and that for things like seaweeds is a you know a background or a food source to a wide range of other invertebrates. Um, and so investigating how uh, color changing or camouflage animals in general cope with these changes is gonna be an interesting area uh, in the future, which those guys are cracking on with. Um, and now I'm gonna have a shameless plug for Rafa uh, at the Century Ecology and the Visual Ecology Labs at the University of Exeter down here in Cornwall. Uh, well, they, we, I say we, I've, I'm, I have no talent in this whatsoever, but much cleverer people than me create these great uh, citizen science games where you can log on and try and find these camouflaged animals and it helps the researchers understand how particular camouflage strategies might be working under certain conditions um, and so I've given uh, uh, Kieran a link so hopefully you'll post that in the chat but you can play this game and the data will be used in scientific outputs in the future and will help us understand uh, how chameleon prawn camouflage works in, in, at a different level. So yeah, that's me. Thanks for listening. Um, I need to thank my supervisors, uh, Martin Alistair from my PhD, uh, Rafa, who's been a great help to me throughout my whole uh, prawn uh, career, and then students like Anna and Christy, who have been continuing the great work, and then George, who's created these really cool prawn graphics, also does lots of really interesting camouflage research um, by himself. And then I need to thank my new employers at Wild Fish Conservation. Uh, for letting me bunk off for the afternoon to come talk about prawns. So yeah, thank you very much.